Um, probably we'll have a few more join along the way. Um, hi, my name is Mari Russ. I am the chair of CRAN this year and Megan is my co-chair at Coexist. Um, I just wanna say thank you to our sponsors, um, Design Pay. I don't know if Ryan is here from, oh, there he is. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Good morning, yeah. Thank you, Mark, for the, uh, for the introduction and, and thanks everyone at CRAN for allowing us to sponsor this event. Again, I'm Ryan with the with Design Pay, and uh, I'm going to throw my contact information in the chat here. But uh, if any firms need assistance, you know, streamlining their invoicing or expediting their receivables, you know, feel free to let me know. But thanks again, everyone. Excellent, thank you. And Chris at Exclusive Windows and Doors. Hey, how are y'all? Well, good morning. Welcome to the second CRAN of 2021. We're excited to be a sponsor again this year, and, and look forward to a successful. 2021 with all of our architect friends. Excellent, thank you. And then last but not least, our newest sponsor, Barrett Flooring and Design. And I'm not sure if anybody's here from them, but maybe. Um, okay, well, thank you all of you sponsors. Thank you again. Um, and I also wanna thank Christoph and Miguel for putting together this presentation. Uh, when Megan and I were trying to plan tours and try to think about our year ahead, uh, you know, and, and being virtual, we thought like what better way than to try to dive into more learning units and like more comprehensive units. And we thought uh, positive energy would be great for that. And we're really, really excited that Christoph said yes. And we're looking forward to this presentation. Hey. And, oh, sorry, if everyone else can just mute and turn off your camera so that uh, speaker view will just be the best um, to do this presentation. Thank you. Should I start now? Yes, please. Okay. Thanks, Mari. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you all so much for um, for being here, for listening, and uh, guess a little bit of housekeeping, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Please um, put the questions in the chat and um, Miguel or Mari or someone will interject them as appropriate. We also have time to talk about them at the end. My, my yapping part will probably last about an hour and then we'll, uh, we'll go through this. So yeah, I'm Christoph Irwin. I'm principal here at Positive Energy. And today we're gonna to talk about systems of systems. We're gonna talk about a possible future for architecture and building science and um, for those of you that might not know about positive energy, we've grown and evolved, right? So we are a, a, a mission in search of a business model in some ways. And so these are the services we offer now. We're really working at this place where architecture and engineering touch. So here we are in the AIA. I am, I am really deeply honored to be here and to be part of the AIA Austin community. So many good friends. I just got to page through a lot of you that are here. Uh, and Central Texas AI community. We are really thriving, we're doing well. Um, Positive Energy is working in lots of communities. We're, we're actually working with project teams across the country right now and some internationally. And that's really important. And it's, it's kind of given me some confidence to say some of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna be speaking about today because there's this, there's this broader perspective. There's a beautiful quote, it says, what do they know of London, he, they who only London know? And we're kind of getting into that. Like, what do we really know of architecture and building science if we mainly know just, just our little piece of it? So there's lots of fresh ideas here, lots of fresh content, very wide ranging, somewhat geeky at times. My intention, as you'll see, is not to focus on technical details um, and you'll see why. And I was just telling um, Mari and Julie at the beginning, I feel somewhat exposed here. This is very personal. I'm, I'm really just telling you some things from my heart today. Uh, and my heart's a little geeky, I guess. So let's get started. So here we go. When it comes to the future of uh, architecture, I think it's a good thing to look at the, the kind of the recent past. I think we all know that uh, like the Architecture 2030 Challenge started in 2002. So we have nearly 20 years of effort you know, pushing to, tr to change traditional practices. And I relate to this like a massive flywheel. Imagine like a massive metal flywheel and we all have a pole and we're trying to push it and get it moving. When we all push it the first, what happens? 
it is daunting. It is intimidating. Progress is scant. Exertion is high, right? But eventually it starts to move just very incrementally. And I think that that's what's happening. And in fact, in a kind of paradoxical way, the pandemic, uh, you know, the slogan, come back stronger. I feel like we are in the process. We as a community, we are in the process of coming back stronger. We, are, we have been pushing on the flywheel for 20 years, but the adherence to traditional practices is really something that we're like, okay, let's think about the outcomes that traditional practices gave us. Um, so that's the flywheel. I'm thinking of a more massive one in my head, but it's not just one flywheel, right? If you think about it this way, we're, we're interconnected, right? There's more than one massive flywheel. Imagine these gears are the AEC industry and beyond, right? We're all interconnected. Our forces for change are acting on each other and our forces to stay with the status quo and resist progress are acting on each other. So like interlocking flywheels, like uh, architects, engineers, builders, trades, owners, developers, appraisers, lenders. That's where this talk's gonna go today. We have changed course and we're gaining momentum. The motive force is building, but we have a long way to go, right? So as I mentioned, 2030 challenge started in 2000, excuse me, 2030, Architecture 2030 started in 2002. The challenge started in 2006, right? So if we are going to achieve carbon neutral buildings by 2030, I don't have to tell you, we need to get after it, right? We got a lot of work to do. It reminds me of, um, I don't know, that song, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. You remember that one? We're going to do what they say can't be done. And that red line below, that's buildings. That's us, you guys. That's us, right? We are there are no secret other members of society that are, are engaged with this transition that we're involved in. And so the very good news is that it's underway, right? There, there's no um, lack of understanding. There's no lack of technology. Uh, we have the science, we have the materials, we have everything we need to do to achieve state-of-the-art buildings with fantastic outcomes on multiple dimensions, right? Multiple dimensions of beauty, right? So think about, oh, I should turn this screen off. Think about this little supercomputer in your pocket, right? Think about the state-of-the-art data centers, right? And then think about our buildings. This is from less than a month ago. Yeah, less than a month ago in Austin. This is a building with essentially cardboard and plastic bags. Um, on their shell. And you can see that pile of limestone. They're going to put a reservoir cladding around it. I also know this community. I bike through it regularly. They're going to put cellulose insulation in this. So we have a long way to go, right? Um, this, this was on the, uh, this is the kind of the metaphor, right? It's very necessary to have a horse and it's necessary to have water. That does not mean the horse will drink the water. So maybe that's us. We need to lie down on the ground and demonstrate to the horse that this is what you need to do, right? What is it that we will do to make our, our uh, horses drink, right? So here at Positive Energy and with a lot of you actually, a lot of uh, lunches and coffees and you know uh, beers and such, we have been thinking, talking, writing, blo podcasting, blogging about how is it that we are gonna achieve the unrealized upside potential of our homes, right? This has been happening for more than a decade now is, going through this talk and I found some things that we wrote in 2010. So how do we get there, right? We're gonna go on a journey now. Let's, let's get into the Wayback Machine. So this was uh, positive energy about eight years ago. Um, Miguel thankfully is, is still alive and healthy, but one of these fits got T-boned downtown Austin. Um, the other one is at his house, right? It would be here, but there's no here here. We're still remote officing. So building science is on the door of that car, right? It's always been core to positive energy. It was with real humility and kind of some nervousness and trepidation that I, you know, we said, we are gonna be about building science, right? So the mechanical designs, the enclosure, high performance enclosures, that is all the sciences applied to buildings, right? So we're gonna be talking about that now. I just wanna, you know, you know I'm an engineer, um, physicist and engineer, I was a builder for a long time and now I'm talking to a group of architects. So I think it's good to kind of get some, get some terms in order. So these two are best basically, you know, come from a quick Google search, architecture. 
the process and the product. Architecture is a, is a verb and a noun. The art and the craft of designing and constructing buildings, right? And not just buildings. And engineering, right? The use of science and math to design and make things that achieve practical outcomes. So if you kind of put those together, you have what's happening in our community, right? You have what could be called building science, right? Using architecture, engineering, and systems thinking. That is where building science is, right? It is systems of systems of systems. Using architecture, engineering, and systems thinking to design and build beautiful buildings that achieve practical outcomes, right? Never doubt that aesthetic and performance, right? The, the, the uh, architectural design and the perf performative design, never doubt that they are uh, anything but a both and situation, right? So this is what we mean when we say design excellence, right? We are saying now that we need beautiful buildings that have achieved or are achieving practical outcomes, right? And by that, by practical, um, you know, I, I'm meaning like things that we all agree need to be the outcomes, right? These are, these are the outcomes that designing buildings uh, and building buildings will achieve. So I'm far from the first person to uh, kind of have that idea, right? This is the statement of the first object of nomination to become an AIA fellow, right? The highest honor within the AIA to promote the aesthetic, scientific, and practical efficiency of the profession, right? So this is right where we are right now today. This is the convergence of architecture and engineering, the use of science and math to design and build beautiful buildings that achieve practical outcomes, right? So goodness knows our souls need beauty, right? And not just beauty in, in like, oh, I see it, it's beautiful, but social justice, racial justice, environmental justice. These are things that are deep in us and we have a sense of the way things should be, right? And so that's also either beautiful or, or hard to bear witness to for us. And I think the last, the last year, whoo -wee, we've been bearing witness to a lot, y'all. So practical outcomes, outcomes that are useful, they're functional, they're effective, they're appropriate, they're timely, right? We've probably all seen this one, right? The ultimate practical outcome is responding to the climate crisis that is already here, right? We live on this planet. We don't actually live in our digital worlds, although I'm coming to you digitally. And we resource ourselves from the natural ecosystems and resources that this planet provides, right? Don't doubt that. It doesn't come from nowhere comes from the planet. So of course we wanna stop ecosystem damage and resource depletion. Of course we wanna make this transition away from destructive traditional practices, destructive traditional systems and paradigms that are established, right? There is this interconnected flow of ideas, resources, and energy that has achieved something like a stable equilibrium. Everyone knows their relationship to each other. Money can flow, economies can function but is leading in a direction where we can't go, right? We just can't. So one site, countless challenges, a looming deadline. I mean, one could say the deadline is, is on us. This is the ultimate product and this is the ultimate practical endeavor. Well, how do we do this? How do we get there? Well, that depends, right? How good is our map? That's kind of what I wanna to talk to you about today is our map, right? Thinking about it collectively here in the United States, at this time in United States culture, where are we going? Where are we now? More importantly, are we even using the same map? <laughs> you know, are we using an accurate map? You know, I hear things like my clients don't believe in solar. What, well, what, what does that mean? Right? What don't they believe in? They don't believe the sun is shining. They don't believe you can convert it to energy. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper now. This is where I feel exposed and a little nervous, right? But big picture, where are we now as far as the map? I would, say, I would posit to you that we are currently in the land of harmful actions. Harmful in, in the sense that they're harmful to the humans, pollutant exposures. They're harmful to the natural ecosystems upon which we humans depend. So we're in the land of harmful actions leading to terrible outcomes that nobody wants. 
we need to disrupt that. And we are, that momentum I was talking about, we are moving toward uh, gradually, <laughs> maybe too slowly, we're moving toward um, the land of less bad, doing less damage, doing less harm, you know, making our buildings a little more efficient, but still the embodied carbon is through the roof, right? We still live in boxes filled with plastic foam. So we're in the land of, you know, harmful actions, moving to the land of less bad, and, you know, we're headed toward the land of sustainability, but even sustainability is basically like net zero. We need net positive. We need to go to net regenerative practices, right? So think about yourselves as explorers, right? And we are the pioneers that are leading, leading this. There's no one else. There's no one coming to save us. I just listened to a beautiful podcast about, um, I think it was Katrina hitting New Orleans. Oh, it's incredible. But, you know, the government is telling you right now, there is no one else. It is up to you to save us. That's pretty poignant. So we really need to, to recognize that if, if you guys out there, if you people and me, if we're focused on doing things better, can you feel the implicit reference point of traditional practices in that? Doing things better is not what we need, right? We need to be doing better things. What is it we don't see when we're focused on doing things better? What is it we do see when we focus on doing better things? So the answer is that we see that we're all connected, right? This is a system of systems of systems, like this call, right? This Zoom call, right? What is this? Uh, ideas are flowing from you know me right now to you, and soon they're going to be flowing from you to me, and then back. Right? That's what we have here. We have engineers, architects, builders, and we get into this. So this is like classic systems of systems view. These three systems: enclosure systems, mechanical systems, and climate systems. So it's like classic building science, like classic rock, like you think, you know, hear the Led Zeppelin riff or something. But what we're having is, you know, generally speaking, enclosure systems, oh boy, oh boy, do we love to talk about enclosures, right? We are, they are physical, we see them, our clients see them. And mechanical systems, they're behind the walls. It's not, you know, we don't tell our clients, hey, look, you don't actually live in the walls, you live in the air contained by the walls. You live immersed in this compressible fluid that is the indoor environment. And it is your dominant pollutant exposure and your dominant experience of life, 30 pounds a day, right? You know, you, you eat and drink about three to four pounds. What you breathe goes into your blood. So we need to really focus on mechanical systems. I would like that to be one of your takeaways is like, oh yeah, my clients live in the air contained by their houses and I'm generally a very positive person and just speaking very accurately, the state of the mechanical industry in, in, in central Texas is, is not in good shape. There's, there's some really tremendous, that does not contradict that there are some really tremendous installing contractors in our community. Some of them allied very well with AIA. Um, and some of them I think would agree with me. Like, yeah, generally speaking, it's a, it's a degraded culture that's arguing for the past, arguing for its limitations. Um, argue for your limitations and they're yours. So this is where I want to take this talk. These are the three main themes that we're going to be talking about. This is an expanded systems view, right? It's still sciences applied to the built world to achieve beautiful buildings with practical outcomes. Planetary systems, human systems, and digital systems, right? So we know about these systems. So just relax now, and I'm gonna be talking about these systems. So we're gonna start with planetary systems. And uh, if you really take like the, the largest expansive view, here we are, this is us, right? What do we have? We have this planet, the sun is shining radiation on it. By the way, two minutes, two minutes of the energy that it's incident on the earth can power, power the global economy for a year, right? We have the moon. The moon is not inconsequential. So we have the sun, earth, and moon. The earth is massive. It sucks gases, holds them to its surface, right? That is this thin veneer, far thinner than the skin of an apple to an apple. 
we live in the atmosphere, right? We're living at the bottom of this massive sea, trillions of tons, gravity holding the atmosphere to the planet. Um, and we treat the, this atmosphere like a free public sewer for the most part. We're, we're starting not to, hopefully now we're, we're gonna stop. But what, do we don't, what don't we see here, right? We don't see that the earth's core is hot, that we have plate tectonics that are moving. Um, the minerals, the microbes, the oceans, the rivers, lakes, the moon exerts gravity and causes tides which deeply influence weather, right? So the earth is spinning on a tilted axis and traveling in an ellipse that gives us the seasons, right? Gives us our days, it gives us our weather as well. We live in the biosphere, the surface of the earth. We use these minerals, microbes, air, water, sun, weather, all of it. That is our rich inheritance. We have what we need, right? We can do this. We humans are perhaps the most influential living beings on the planet. With our thoughts, with our actions, we have tremendous power and we have tremendous influence over our society, right? And I just wanna, I'm gonna say this a few times, but I know there's people on this call that aren't architects, but those of you that are architects, that is a respected, powerful role in our society. Right? With great power comes great responsibility. It is really time to, to be very skeptical about everything you've learned in school, perhaps, and think about what is it that you see when you, when you think about doing better things. So here we are, we have, um, you know, this is our world, right? We have the primary motive forces for all life on earth, for energy from the sun. We have land, air, water. These are the real wealth of our planet. Right? We have certain people that own gas that can be get fracked out of the ground and they become billionaires. But you know, one could argue that is, the, that is planetary wealth meant for everyone that is on the planet. Um, I think on the lower left there, the importance of deep earth heat is, um, is kind of underappreciated. So, but let's talk, so we have the woods, we have the weather in the top left, right? We have the forest, we have the, all the ecosystems in that. We have the oceans, you know, which with plankton, the largest daily migration is billions of tons of plankton float to the surface, receive sunlight, and then sink back down and become food for the oceans, right? They have sunk back down and they have become high density fuels over time. We have rain. The chemical potential of rain is something we often overlook. Water is the source of life because aqueous chemistry exists, right? The water molecules are, we are water, right? So let's talk for a second about what you put into your tank and where it comes from. So on the left is a mag microscopic, you can't see these every time you go in the ocean, there they are. This is plankton. These are living creatures, multicellular living creatures, right? Some of them are more like unicellular, but they feed on sunlight, very low, you know, very low in the life, in the, in the food cycle, but they're very important. So sunlight, water, minerals creates this richness this life, this energy, organized energy, and like we're organized energy, then they die and by gravity, they sink to the bottom and they form these massive layers, miles thick. So you also need to think about time, the power of time as a force. So they sink to the bottom of the oceans and then plate tectonics exist, right? We have this mantle. <laughs> Right, we know we know it exists because we see it through volcanoes. But plate, you know, the California plate or whatever it's called, there's a plate driving under California that's causing earthquakes at the San Andreas Fault. So those living creatures they get buried, and they get exposed to deep earth heat and pressure, gravity again, for millions of years, and eventually, the right combinations of ingredients we have oil, we have these these tremendously precious high energy density fuels, right? From deep underground, we take them, and we put them into the sky, right? Now, not to insult Gaia, um, you know, and not to ignore natural forces like volcanoes and fires, but it is unlikely that the earth itself as an ecosystem that was, you know, achieving optimization over millennia thought to itself, oh, I better watch out because someone is gonna take these carbon deposits that have been buried deep, deep underground and put them in the sky, right? Billions of tons of carbon into the sky. That's definitely changing the, the environment. Even wind power, right? You have the sun shining on the earth. You have this heavy trillions of tons of atmosphere on the earth. And what is it? 
the sun heats it unevenly. It heats the side exposed to the sun. It's also spinning. It's also tilted the earth. So uneven heating and gravity lead to wind, right? So of course, of course, we need to start powering our global economy from that source, right? And sun directly. Of course, it's ridiculous to say, we're gonna continue to power the global economy from coal and gas, right? Whatever your beliefs are about coal and gas, look at that picture of the earth and recognize it is finite. Um, and if we wanna have humanity thriving on this planet infinitely, you know, indefinitely, we, we can do that. <clears throat> so this is a visualization of reality. Right? The big rectangle represents the entire planet's natural ecosystems. This is energy systems language. It's a, it's a way to visualize reality and it's a way to quantify reality. It's very powerful. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about it, but I don't want you to get too hung up on it. Let's just go through the basics. The big rectangle, that's the entire planet's natural ecosystem. The circle on the left, those are the forces that we just talked about vast quantities of low grade energy sources that are active over tremendous time scales, vast time scales. They get combined to make the resources that we live on, minerals, soils, trees, and they get stored, right? So they get like soil is natural wealth. Oil, we just mentioned is natural wealth. The forest canopy feeds back and regulates itself. That's very important, that feedback loop over here. So we know this picture too, right? This is, this is the, uh, what was that? It's called, not a Gantt chart. It's a Sankey diagram. But look up here on the top left, top right. Two thirds of what we harvest from the planet is rejected, is wasted energy. So we have all we need, but we're not really availing ourselves of it. So you know, narrowing the focus back down to the custom residential architect network. This is more where we are. And this is more what we need to talk about. Humans seek shelter. We've sought shelter for a long time. Architecture and building science may be among the oldest and most enduring human endeavors. So what an honor to be part of it. We, you know, shelter is important and it can have multiple dimensions of quality. And the Vitruvian trident is one example of that, right? Fermitas, strength, protection. Today it would include indoor air quality, right? Utilitas, usefulness. Today, it must include resilient energy and water sources, venustas, beauty, proportion, balance. Today, this is where social, racial, environmental justice comes in. So I'm not sure that it, during Vitruvius's time, it was very important. I'm not sure that he commented, let's say, on sustainable sourcing of materials or um, using energy in ways that did not impair future generations from having a high quality of life. But that's up to us. That's you know, this is a huge topic and it does fall to us. There was a time not long ago where it seemed like the earth's resources were inexhaustible and human cunning and ingenuity was beyond belief and we were gonna solve all this. That's the fifties and sixties, you know? Did these lumberjacks on the right, did they have heavy hearts? Did they know that they were on a trajectory on which 96% of redwood forests in the United States were wiped out? Started in the 1800s, but it ended in the 1970s, y'all. This is not, you know, old history. So the woods, you know, we talk about woods. It's easy to think that the wood comes from lumber yards rather than the forest. It's like auto debit on your card. You don't have to think about how much your energy costs every month or your gas bill costs every month. This is a forest, that diagram on the left. Now the box represents a forest. It's like a scalable window. Again, you have low grade energy operating for a vast period of time on the left. And then you have the output, you have forest products, you have logs, it's a flow diagram. So ignore the numbers, except to notice there are numbers. We can quantify this. We can do all kinds of awesome math and science here, right? So the forest production, it's wood, but it is dependent on what? Sunlight, rain, air, microbes, soil. Notice the, the, at the bottom, the used energy, that is soil erosion. That is what happens when we don't have sustainably managed forests. We still get the wood at the right, but we lose the resource upon which future wood um, creation, production depends. So we can work up a diagram for a modern cabin in the woods, right? It gets kind of complicated. 
um, when I was first thinking about this, I literally thought I'm just going to show this diagram and we're going to walk through it. But I, I started down that route and realized, no, this needs context. So let's stay high level, right? Humans seek shelter. Think about these, what we've made for ourselves, these man-made canyons of concrete, glass, and steel, hemorrhaging energy, right? You need to think at least 10 times the energy use when you have a glass building like this, right? We're still doing it, but it is like winding our watch on the way to the gallows. If you were gonna draw the, the diagram for these, these are massive infrastructures, like the potable water, the energy, the gas, you know, gray water, black water, all of these systems, they're huge and they're present and they're somewhat invisible to us, which is a problem. We're highly visual creatures. So this is just an example, don't, don't look at it, but <laughs> residents on the left, a city on the right, you saw that I had all of nature in one. This is a very, very powerful methodology. It's called energy systems language. And it comes from probably one of the most influential people <laughs> in my on my career right and i would love for you to meet howard odom he's passed away but that's him on the top i don't know if bill bram met him personally but dr william bram uh, is a fellow in the aia he's a professor at architecture at upenn in philly he was introduced to me by elena zambrano the wife of my dear friend and co-worker and colleague partner in all this uh, corey squire formerly out of lake flato so he wrote a book called Architecture and Systems Ecology, and I would, I would highly encourage you guys to, to get it and to read it. I actually read it twice, fully, and um, I still learn from it. It's one of those books you're like, oh, did I read that before? So let's talk about the loss at the bottom here. Again, every system, right? So your, um, your refrigerator is running. You want it to make cold, but it also sheds heat, right? That's that, that little thing at the very bottom right here. This is where it all goes. Quick example of that right here, hot water leaking out, right? So first of all, it's potable water, huge energy input. Secondly, it was moving. There could be friction, you know, we need pressure in the pipe, it's leaking out. So we're losing that pressure. Thirdly, it's hot. So it's, it should be insulated, right? So we surround ourselves with tremendous resources and we really need to treat them precious the way they are. We need to think in the systems of systems of systems. This is an example of invisible systems, right? The, the port of Long Beach, lower, lower left here, has never had crowding the way it does right now. The super tankers, which by the way, leak and catch fire sometimes. These are energy flow and resource flow systems. This is the global shipping network on the top left. The rail network in the US, right? So systems are everywhere, but we don't see them. We're distracted, we're overwhelmed. We have fire hoses of information aimed at our, our puny little teacups of brain. And we're blinded by science. This is really unfortunate. So I, you know, I come out of physics and engineering and science gets energy so wrong. Science treats a BTU, British thermal unit, as anything that can raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. It says a calorie is anything that can raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So it treats energy like heat. Anything that can be converted to heat is energy and it's basically all equivalent. That's completely nuts, right? Sunlight just comes on the planet for free. We've talked about how plate tectonics and deep earth heat is needed to create natural gas. What if I tried to harness enough neural energy, you know, from the synaptic firings in my brain to heat water, right? Obviously we need energy that recognizes the transformation from the primary planetary resources, right? That's energy, energy with memory. It used to be called embodied energy, but then there was some, some confusion. It's not the same as embodied carbon. And I can't go there, it'll take too long. So I want, I want you to understand that on the left, we have inputs that arrive freely from nature, low-grade energy sources that act over vast scales. At the top, we have what we humans have, have harvested, have collected, have uh, pulled together. The most important thing is on the right. What are the outputs? Architects, you're designing buildings and buildings and homes are intended to produce something. They're producing healthy, happy, productive members of society. What does it mean to be productive, right? What are you producing? Are you, are you simply producing, I don't know, meat that lies on the couch and entertains itself? Or are you, are you engaged? 
So I had planned to go through quite a few of these. I'm just gonna go through three right now. Whenever you're using gas heat, I want you to be clear that burning methane in air it makes a 3,500 degree flame. So to use it to heat food, right? Even the highest temperature cooking is like 400 degrees. To use it to heat water to 160 degrees or 130 degrees, to use it to heat your, you know, to use a gas furnace to heat your house air to 70 degrees, it is destroying useful energy. And it <laughs> dances with wolves. Have you guys all seen that movie? I mean, probably a lot of us have. Do you remember that scene where the Native Americans came up and saw a field of buffalo killed for their fur? Right? Whoa. That's destroying useful energy. When you use gas heat, please remember that, feel that, right? I don't mean guilt yourself, but like next time you make a decision, talk to a client and they say, oh, you know, you can, I need a gas furnace, right? I need a gas water heater. I want an on-demand gas water heater. It's ridiculous, right? We could use a heat pump. We can harvest otherwise unusable ambient heat and make water, even when it's 40 degrees out, we can make 160 degree water one unit of energy input, four units of energy output. Those systems, if it's warm, which it is in Austin a lot, you can get above five units of energy out. That's a COP, coefficient of performance above five. So energy, right? I don't know if you've seen this, this came out last December, but basically if we as a society follow this green curve and we do clean energy, distributed energy renewables, distributed energy renewables, that means solar and storage on buildings, on homes. We as a society can save nearly half a trillion dollars by 2050, right? This is huge news. Like this is probably the most powerful systems of systems in our world, the financial and banking sector. You know, we should high five. We should just like, this is like the biggest thing that makes me so happy. <laughs> My daughter and I have been talking about this, right? Financial and banking sectors, investors are urgently calling for transparency regarding climate risk. They want to know what companies on my balance sheets are investments that are exposed to climate risk. And if they aren't disclosed, which they currently are not required to be in the United States, climate risk is a risk for investors. So we have BlackRock, right? Eight, almost $9 trillion under management calling, making this statement, right? So remember outputs, happy, healthy, productive members of society. So now we're going to talk about human systems. These next two sections are much quicker. And thank you for listening. I haven't heard any questions, but. So human systems, can you see the flow systems now? Can you think in systems? Can you understand what this is? That this is a machine that can be intended to produce human thriving, right? Can we, can we recognize that the way we treat our, our projects is primarily as visual spatial economic optimization processes, right? It's not ridiculous to do that, but it is very low bar to do that. It is very non-visionary to do that. There are myriad dimensions of quality. Look at the human systems, right? I mentioned architects, engineers, builders. It goes on and on and on. Legislators, I'm just gonna pick a few, right? Um, distributors. What is in the supply house at my local HVAC distributor, right? That's important. Who chose that, right? You know who chooses that, by the way? The manufacturers. They come in, they market to the distributors, and right? So we have manufacturers telling distributors, telling installers, telling the society what they want. Fox guarding the hen house, and we don't even talk about it. Podcasters, bloggers, YouTubers. This gets into the section on digital systems, but Fundamentally, what is it we're doing as professionals? What is it that we use to guide our decisions? What is it that's on our dashboard, right? What do we measure? I mean, primarily we measure customer preferences and we say, oh, our clients aren't interested in solar. They like granite counters, right? You know, architects have a lot of power. They could stand up to that and say that that's, that's neither or and it's a both and. We pay attention to awards. We pay attention to click-through weights. We pay attention to profits. and. In the building world, we love to peacock around our values and blower door scores, right? And good U values. What could we measure? We could measure the actual outcomes we want, not the inputs. We could measure health, wellness, comfort. We could measure the health, the mental and physical health of our community, the mental, not mental, the physical health of our planetary resources, our oceans, rivers, lakes, forests, right? Do we do that? Not so much. We do it, but we don't avail ourselves of adjacent expertise, right? So. Positive Energy just released a bunch of COVID reports to some schools, 
you know, we're kind of blending building science with the medical sciences, right? Today, I am here to ask you if you know of people at universities that are experts in social science, social psychology, behavioral sciences, behavioral economics, huge force, marketing and consumer behavior, legislation and regulation. These are the people we need to recognize that we are part of that system, right? We talk to these people. Every time you make a phone call, send an email, have a meeting, you are an information flow structure. You're an information technology, information flow technology. Where do geology, oceanography, this, this whole list of you know, forestry science, fishery science, how do those factor into what we're doing? Or do we think of them as over there in that silo and I'm over here in this silo, right? There is one thing occurring, one giant interwoven, interconnected, interdependent thing. It's all, all one. That reminds me of Dr. Bronner's soap, all one. Digital systems. Oh boy, the World Wide Web. This is like a obvious like recognition that digital systems create an interconnected mesh, right? Mainly of idea flow, information flow. We're in the information age, moving farther away from knowledge and even farther away from wisdom. It's been said that one of the most powerful uh, forces, currently probably a destructive force, are the three words, free with ads, right? We have internet influencers trying to put eyeballs on ads. We have massive supercomputers aimed at your brain, right? Anyone that's a parent, you know, has kids, has thought about this, right? right? They're not on Facebook and Twitter like on the previous one. They're you know, on Snap, Snapchat or Discord or something. But the core issue is that systems depend on feedback, right? Um, these systems right now are, are, are optimized to, and give feedback to uh, keep your eyeballs on that site as long as possible. And that seems like such a wasted opportunity to me, right? Accurate, timely feedback is crucial to system science. I don't know if you remember the centrifugal governor. I don't know if you even took that class in college, but locomotive engines used to blow up, right? A lot until we perfected how to control the rate of fuel, right? That feedback loop. Feedback is fundamental. And notice on the bottom, appropriate of feedback. Without that, we get system failure, right? Appropriate means accurate and timely. Now think about, you know, the flash mobs created by social media, by bots, right? We don't have accurate, timely feedback and feedback is fundamental to system science and the lack of accurate information can, I would argue is causing some system failure right now. Here's an example, right? Accurate feedback would be this house, you know, at least the sheathing is made of cardboard and trash bags, right? That is literally plastic, right? That's polyethylene, six mil polyethylene. That is not even an eighth of an inch of cellulosic um, sheathing right there, right? But look at the marketing literature, ideally suited for builders demanding the highest value in structural wall sheathing. Do any of us actually believe that? <laughs> Do we see the cynicism disguised as pragmatism in there? Oh, I need to make a lot of profit, therefore I can use crappy products, right? And that's something Corey and Elena and I, Miguel and I have talked to about a lot. This, this cynicism, this pessimism disguised as pragmatism and realism that's rampant in our world. And I wanna be clear, this photo is not old. This is from less than a month ago, right? So. How is it that these degraded versions of outdated traditions persist? Oh, by the way, they're gonna put stone cladding on it, right? Like, yikes. So what is it? How do these outdated traditions persist? It's because we as mammals, we are wired. We are literally wired to adhere to traditions. Don't eat the red berries. Traditionally, we don't eat the red berries, right? That doesn't mean, you know, tradition is unskillful. That's what I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to say tradition is bad, right? I'm trying to say tradition is like guardrails that kind of guide our behavior, but we have the ability to, to think, to, to be uh, rational, not just relational. Tradition is one of the five foundations of morality, right and wrong, right? The other ones are something like in-group loyalty, compassion and kindness, fairness, reciprocity, and then purity, sanctity. There, there's a really cool TED talk about that. So it's not just tradition paradigms are really powerful. Paradigms are our deeply held stories. So deep, we don't even notice them, but they affect all of our decisions, 
right? My goal today is to communicate with you and has been to communicate with you on the level of stories because they are the force that is farthest from the fulcrum. They are the, the blue dot represents the system we want to affect change on. So we need to go far from it. We need to stop thinking about things, please. You know, I, I love to think about filters and heat pumps and ERVs, but I recognize that to get more people to ask me about those is more important than to simply talk about those to the few people that do ask me. As we move out on that fulcrum, we increase our leverage, but we also increase the difficulty to implement change. We get more resistance, traditional practices. People are like, look, when the system is set up this way, the money flows to me, don't mess with it, right? And we also have more impact. So all of you, please think in systems and think in stories. What are your fundamental stories? Here's one, right? For many, many years, the earth was considered to be flat. There are still some people, I have met people in Austin who believe the earth is flat, right? And, and working in our industry, right? The earth is the center of the universe, right? The church really got into that one and people were killed about it, right? Paradigms are our deep-seated stories, so deep we don't even notice them, but they're like the lens on my glasses here. They affect everything. They affect all my perception, or at least visual perception here. What we are in a point of now, all of us on this Zoom call, we are in a place, I mean, we are the 1%, right? I'm sorry to say it, but we are that. We are the 1 billion people out of roughly 7 to 8 billion people that are using the vast majority of the resources. That is really happening. That is really something that we can, we can evolve past. We can pioneer new traditions, right? The excellent news that this is happening, right? We are exploring uh, new territories right now together. Traditional practices helped by COVID are losing their momentum. Canyons of glass, steel, and concrete are probably, uh, they're probably not gonna be built to the same, with the same fervor, let's say, as they used to be. The design process itself, what information do we engage with when? The design process itself is changing. Information flows coming earlier in the process that are referenced to functional outcomes maybe decades down the road, right? Like I didn't get asthma because I have a good air control air and at least a MERV 16 filter and an ERV, right? So what we need is a generation of AEC people, architectural, architect, engineering, and construction that are making their own maps, that are making accurate maps, that are thoughtfully assembling their maps with verifiable information from their own experience. You know, we need to know where we are relative to where we're going. And we need a good map to get there. Otherwise, we're just lost, right? So again, this is a very fundamental issue, right? State of the art, phone in my pocket, digital information flow systems, our homes, we still treat the very places we, we create for ourselves and our clients, our loved ones, as though they're primarily visual, spatial, and economic. We have to push back on, on well-meaning people with outdated maps that, that basically design buildings by the balance sheet, right? Or we need to put on the balance sheet what will be the health of the occupants, what will be the impact on planetary resources, right? That is what we need to do. We can't just say, oh, um, economic, economics doesn't matter. So what is it that turns the light on? We're at the end here. You know, how do we let go of outdated perspectives? This is something I, I really want to, I really want to know. Um, individually and collectively, what is it that turns the light on? How do we do this? We all have been kind of like marinated <laughs> in paradigms for decades many of which are inaccurate and, and unskillful, but they have colored and flavored everything we think and see. We need to recognize that. There are many, many very large issues in the world. We, we are not talking about the biggest ones. And I would say, you know, the, the societal cohesion, uh, mental health issues in our, in our society are profound. Um, but for us today, we are talking about these shovels. We're talking about the shovels that we need to get after it, right? Um, Fundamentally, the state of the world is quite painful today in some ways. I think we all feel that. And is it the case that it's painful because we're not sure we trust ourselves?
to take care of it. We're not sure we trust ourselves to get to work, right? So I am tired of talking about shovels. I will continue to do it, <laughs> but I don't wanna get materialistic. Like, look at these idea baubles. Oh, isn't this cool? We're talking about this cool idea. Oh, we're talking about embodied carbon. And you know, we do need to talk about it, but we need to take actions based on that talk, right? Um, there's work to do, let's get after it. We'll all be glad we did, right? So what, one way to get at, I love this. I've been using this idea of projected hindsight in my life for a while. Project yourself into the future where you have achieved your aspirations. Turn and look back at the past. Or maybe that's this way. What did you do to get there, right? Today, I will tell you that the AEC profession needs to become more outcome focused. Right? We need to get past visual, spatial, economic dominance of the qualities that we achieve. We need to think in systems. We need to, we need to tell our appraiser that that HEPA filter is an added value and the appraiser needs to recognize that, that dehumidifiers add value to homes. We really, really will benefit when we see the design process itself. What consultants do you bring in and when? That is a technology that can change the outcomes, right? We like to say it's, oh, we need good clients to do that, right? And I recognize there's some truth in that. But I also know that there are owners and developers that are ready to listen when we are ready to talk. They are ready to hear what their, let's say their architects say. They have hired you for your expertise, right? Architects. <laughs> You have a respected and powerful role. They, clients take very strong signals from you, especially if you have an F, if you're an FAIA. It's not just an accolade. It means you're in a leadership role. You have power. Your decisions and actions matter. You have role power. You have status power. So business as unusual. I would really like to see us recognize new perspectives, new processes, new target, new outcomes. This is an example of something we're offering where we just, we simply calculate the energy density flowing through every window and we, we call them out, right? We're not saying you can't have that. We just want you to be aware of it and we can make, we can talk about it. So this doesn't have to be super complicated, but let's be frank with each other. We have this Gordian knot right now of cynicism disguised as pragmatism, right? This is not going to be easy. That doesn't mean we should run and hide from this challenge, right? How do we, how do we untie this Gordian knot? And I don't know if you remember, but Alexander's answer was to find an approach to the tangle that rendered the perceived constraints moot. Like in one history, he just pulled a pin out and the knot unraveled. In the other, he just cleaved it with his sword, right? So we need to reframe. We need to resolve ourselves to, to not give up on this. And we need to realize the outcomes we can, and we can, right? We really all are coming down to something like Morpheus's question, like, what is it that I'm about? Am I about, I don't know, blissful ignorance? Or am I gonna see some truths and um, see that I'm part of a larger set of systems, right? We have these human systems, we have these digital systems, and we have these planetary, these natural ecosystems. So my last thought is uh, kind of my first thought. It is important to do things better, but it is far more important to do better things. And with that, I'm done. So are there any questions, y'all? You're muted, Mari. David Weber just asked a great question. <clears throat> He's a- uh... Hi, David. Curious what drives the expectations about what good performance is. Um, thinks that there's some cultural predisposition or preconception uh, that's part of the problem. So maybe we could- Yeah, check out. Top. This is too ironic, David. If I hit forward one more time, this is a slide I just deleted, right? When creatives to turn destructive, right? Like who wrote that ad? Who wrote the ad that said, this is the best value for wall she thing, even though it's cardboard, right? Like, did that person know? Was it like, ha ha, this will trick people? But, but David, unfortunately, like, it's all interwoven, right? The information flow, the marketing messages, the products that exist, the systems, the paradigms, it's all, it's all connected, right? It's, 
I don't know if you guys know about superconductivity, but it's long range order in a crystal lattice. And it's kind of like, that's what all we need to do, right? So all of you, plus all your project partners, plus all the architects on the planet, builders and contractors, we need to all go, okay, ready? One, two, three, step to the left, right? That's what we what? need. I, I don't know how we get there, please. Well, I, I, I think that there are a lot of extreme examples that if we could uh, get around them, and you know, I don't think I have a lot of clients like this, but I think this is a, an example that I feel like I hear a lot from a lot of people who are uh, uh, that are all around us. So here, here's the example. The people who say, oh yes, I just can't stand the heat. You know, we, we do live in Texas. It's a reality. Um, I can't stand the heat and I want to put my, I want my air conditioning to at night to be down to 59 degrees so that I can sleep with a comforter in the middle of the summer. And I feel like that's just a really basic example of what I feel like is a completely unrealistic expectation that we allow ourselves to have. And I think that drives, so, I mean, we don't really, probably a lot of us in this group don't have a lot of people asking for that unrealistic an expectation, I've but maybe we do. Um, yeah. You've well, been, and, please, David, go ahead. And, and I, I feel like, well, can we, can we shift the dialogue and talk more about, hey, how about living more in unison with the climate on a daily basis? What if we have a little bit of air movement and your your summertime sleeping habits are with a sheet and that's it? There's no comforter. There's not this extra air conditioning. Is there something that we can, and that's just a simple example, but I feel like this is those examples show up a lot. And I think it's just this weird preconception we have or weird expectation that, that some of us might bring into the whole discussion at the beginning that, that somehow we should be able to have air conditioning that's so cold yeah uh that it gives us the opportunity to do something that really wouldn't make sense you know in if, if you're looking at what's around you uh, in the climate so yeah so a couple of bits of feedback on that so um if your client asks for that and that is something they want right so i'm not saying we need to talk our clients out of what they want i mean there are times where we might need to tell our clients i don't want to work with you um i don't want to help you achieve that but if they want a super cold bedroom i'm okay with that you need to recognize a couple of things. One is the experience of thermal comfort is dominated by surface temperatures. So don't give them a lot of glass in their bedroom, right? I wanna say that again. Your experience of your indoor environment from a thermal perspective is dominated by the surface temperatures around you. It is not dependent on air temperature, but you're right about ceiling fans. The next thing to say is, <laughs> I see the indoor weather pros is on here. Hey, Chris and Chris. Um, Air conditioning systems can hit around 68 degrees, maybe slightly lower than that, but they are not refrigeration systems. If someone says something in the 50s, you need to give them a wine room system. You need to tell them, we're giving you a high temperature refrigeration system in your bedroom. That just changed the control layers, right? In our climate, you need vapor control tremendously for wine rooms. Architects that put windows in wine rooms, I'm not gonna go there. Um, so so you, you, can, you can solve these problems. And my last piece about that is just make the bedroom cold, not the whole house, right? If there was ever a time that a solution that called for narrow zoning, it was that. But, but I, just so you know, Christoph, I do feel like our obligation as architects is, oh, is that a, I, I do think our role as architects is to try and uh, change the conversation and try and question what people's real impulses are and see if there isn't another way of achieving comfort. Um, you know, ultimately what they want is comfort and, and convenience and, you know, all, they, they want the same end result, even if they can get there a different ways. So I feel like as architects, it is our job to maybe say, well, can we achieve it's your ultimate goal of comfort in a different yeah. way? Yeah. Let's um, just circulate cold water in the headboard of the bed or in the wall next to the headboard. That'll cool their head. That'll cool their body. They'll have what they want. Yeah, I agree with you. And and David, man, I, I high five you for wanting to change them. I'm, I am just not comfortable telling you all, you need to change their behavior, right, <laughs> or change their their paradigms. Um, I'm great. I'm I'm kind of grateful if you do, because many times, there's this. 
it's like um what's that song that has uh you walked like, like you're walking onto a yacht right you walked in to the party, right? There's this like, all I ask of life is a constant and exaggerated sense of my own importance and everything is referenced to me. You know what? When your clients come in with that, that makes, that does not lead to a high quality life experience. You don't, you don't get happy that way, trafficking in that strategy. <laughs> Great, but now I went really meta on you, sorry. Well, um, I, I, think it, I think it is nice to appeal to, it can be about you, but sometimes when you can, you the client, but sometimes making it about the community around you as well can make it even more about you. So I, I do feel like we bring a certain amount of aspiration to our clients to try and be better uh, in, in the pursuit of their own objectives for themselves. And sometimes being better is by making this contribution along the way that is really just about building a better house or building a better now we've got a long way to go like everybody else there's just so much work to be done but yeah. but um i'm always amazed how much more receptive people can be or are to uh well maybe i should look at if my behavior can affect positively these other people then maybe that is a worthwhile exercise yeah um so yeah, I, agree. I don't know i'm also very pollyanna so you can probably ignore everything i just said yeah, it's, it's interesting. What do we give awards for in the AIA, right? That's a very powerful force. Um, client advocacy, that would be great. That'd be a great award. Someone else. I don't see any more in the chat, but I imagine somewhere will come. Oh, it's, it's uh, oh, we, we can go to one. So we have another half hour if we want. Yes, yes, yes. I'm happy to listen and we, we want to get back to our busy lives. Um, I, I would like to make one personal request or personal slash professional, which is um, if some of you have feedback, especially if it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, dude, swing and a miss or something, you know, or even if it's positive too, you know, and you don't want to present it, share it now. Um, it's important to me that these ideas found their mark in some ways. And so I would like any advice you can give me to help make that happen. I got another question. Um, what about when we're talking about renovations of older buildings? You know, how do we accurately kind of frame the way we talk about that? How do we, uh, you know, come up with creative and meaningful technical solutions, that sort of thing? Maybe we can touch on that. Is that from the chat or is that from the Miguel? That is from the chat. Okay. Um, I have a, I have some ideas. Does someone else want to go? How do we deal with existing buildings before I say anything? This is the bashful thing. Okay, so you're also working with your psychology right now. Are you willing to unmute and get on and turn your video on and talk? Uh, in the meantime, I'll just tell you, oh, there's David. Hey, David. So do you remember the, um, the window? You know, we had the low-grade energy. I guess it's the opposite to you. Is this from the left to you guys? Or is that the right? Okay, so we had the low-grade energy flowing in from the left, and we had the high-quality, you know, higher produced materials, but flowing out the bottom was the rejected energy, degraded energy, right? Like using gas to heat your water, right? So when you tear down a building, and by the way, many of us on this call know that there are multi-million dollar homes that get demolished over and over and over to build new multi-million dollar homes, right? That is the drain out of the bottom. That is like topsoil erosion from the forest, right? I'm not saying it should never happen, right? I am saying that is why architecture is so important. It needs to be enduring beauty. Um, but when you do a renovation, you, you cap that off a lot, right? So it's so important that you do that. One of the biggest problems with, um, with doing renovations is that the, the climate and the enclosure, when I put the new mechanical system in, it, it all might not work out, right? And you know, what I guess I'm saying is that we kept our buildings dry and our materials from rotting by hemorrhaging vast quantities of air and heat through the enclosure, right? Obviously, we don't want to keep doing that. So what we need to do is we need to be thoughtful about how we do renovations, which probably means we 
we need to do deep energy retrofits and deep re renovations. We need to expose that wall, right? If someone has used reservoir cladding on the outside, you need to be very thoughtful about that. You can't just air seal an old wall that has brick and air, you know, crappy penetration because that air is going to come in. But you can provide a robust drying function inside and anywhere you can get to the air control layer, you should try to get to it. Um, I was going to just pipe up real quick, Christoph. <clears throat> um, we do a lot of that sort of thing, but from my personal experience, we replaced our air conditioner, which was ancient, and it finally broke in July of 2019. And uh, we live in a 1942 bungalow in central Austin, and it has original windows and is the leakiest, draftiest bungalow of all bungalows. And <laughs> we saw about a 30% reduction in the energy that we used in when we when we put a variable speed system in our house. So just with even that, uh, and we did absolutely nothing. Chris has all these grandiose plans for, you know, how we're going to build this wonderful, you know, fantastic enclosure. But all we had, could afford was to replace our air conditioner. And even that is now using almost a third less energy than previously. And we're way more comfortable and we're probably gonna stick a dehumidifier in here for the shoulder seasons. And we're not gonna see much of an increase in our energy bill or our energy draw. So you, you, you know, I know I'm, we're in the mechanical systems industry but <clears throat> that can make a very measurable difference uh, in a renovation even if all you're doing is replacing the system. Yeah, um, thank you, high five. And you guys presented that at one of our happy hours back in the before times when we could stand in the same room. So thank you for that. That is absolutely, um, that's, that's wisdom, right? Sometimes the enclosure is what it is. And we need to say, well, what other systems are there that I can impact, right? I, I'm, I'm, I thank you for bringing that up, Kristen. Christoph, I got another really great one in the chat. <laughs> Jesse just um, said, I think we would be served to focus on breaking down the silos between ownership and development and architecture and engineering. engineering. We need more aligned teams, maybe shared ownership, trade fees for equity, educating design professionals in finance and deal structuring. So maybe you can touch on that briefly. Um, I could definitely touch on it briefly. Uh, Jesse, do you want to chime in and say some more of that verbally? Or do you want me just to go? I don't see you here. Uh, there you are. I uh, just unmuted. No, I mean, just kind of opening it up there, but I think in general, we, we focus so much on trying to convince clients of something. Um, sometimes we don't understand the math behind their thinking and maybe they don't understand, you know, a lot of where we're coming from. And I think just more education of like, what ownership or what owners are thinking and mot what they're motivated by yeah. and vice versa is something that, you know, would, would serve um, better outcomes in, in our project. I, I agree completely, Jesse. Um, it's a riddle, right? We, we, we say it's like an expression that um, he who has the gold makes the rules. And even in there, right, you hear the patriarchy, maybe they who have the gold make the rules. But the reality is that, um, like I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it's great, it's good to name names, but you know, we're getting firms coming to us and saying, hey, we want to do early phase energy modeling, so we know what we just signed up for the 2030 challenge, and we want to know what our EUI is, and we want to know how to optimize it during early design phase, right? We, um, you know, getting back into the owner question, and we have architects who have said, I'm gonna put ERVs in every project. I'm gonna stop making my clients homes with um, plastic foam insulation in the enclosure. I'm gonna to switch to new in office standard enclosures that are, that are based on lower embodied carbon materials, right? So architecture offices can define their own culture and define their own standards and the, the uh, clients can be, can shop, right? Over time, a client gets turned away from several architecture firms because um, I guess because the developer, let's say, has been told, you know, I, I reckon the developer will be told by the architect, it is very important that this project be profitable. I absolutely want that. Um, it is also important that 
I am okay helping you design what it was that got built. Um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, development that it, it's not fundamentally different from the 1970s, 80s, 90s. I mean, pick one. It's like we're, we're, we're really stuck by tradition because it's what we know, right? Um, we wanna call up our sub and just say, go. We don't wanna really stay engaged. Um, I feel like I'm kind of rambling. Hey, someone else, that's a huge important topic. Someone else on this call has an idea that should be shared right now. Who is it? Do, 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 do. Dude. New questions on the chat so far. Okay, uh, good. Let's have the new ones. But that was a great one, Jesse. And, and I don't know that I uh, have I answered it for you. So uh, someone just piped in thermal anesthesia exclamation point times four. What is it? <laughs> oh my goodness. So I'm an engineer, and I'm I am uh, tasked. One of the things we do is mechanical design, and in that role, we are tasked with giving you thermal blandness. We are tasked with, it's going to be X degree temperature, probably 72, and it's going to be Y relative humidity, probably 50, 55%, right? But I'm a mammal. I respond to changes in my central nervous system. I would like it, like I would like an architect office to say, the hallways are going to be kept at a different set point. Let's say we keep the hallways at 82. You walk into the living room now, ah, I have just created delight. I have just created, uh, the light's good enough, a thermal sensation that leads to a positive mental emotional state. That is thermal anesthesia. We can, we can stop saying, look, I'm afraid that my client is gonna freak out if any portion of the room is, is below a certain, above a certain temperature in the summer, let's say. Um, and this comes back, thermal anesthesia comes back. If I want my client, like David's example, to be in a very cold place to sleep, it cannot have a ton of glass, right? And, and you know, because the radiant energy will exchange regardless of what the air temperature is, that the warmer glass surface will radiate heat to the client, right? Or in winter, right? The warmer skin surface will radiate heat to the cold glass. So thermal anesthesia is on the horizon. I'm gonna be interviewing, it, it's, it's out of the Lawrence Berkeley group that does some of the research for this um, comfort standard, ASHRAE standard 55. And uh, I'm going to be interviewing someone from that group on the podcast, and we'll know more about it. But fundamentally, it's what I said. It's about saying, these are mammals, these are humans. We don't just give them blandness and high five ourselves and call it done. Good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, David had another comment here. Um, animals are able to adapt to dramatic changes in their environments. And our expectation is to avoid these changes completely. How about if we avoided the dramatic changes, but can deal with and remind our clients of the benefit of dealing with reasonable changes in our environments? Mm -hmm. David, you want to comment on that? Well, it's, it's really just what you were talking about. I just, I, I, I think you're right. Maybe a hallway is a different set point, but I, I feel like it, one of the things we try and do is build in a lot of ability for the buildings that we're designing for clients to live more with the seasons on a more regular basis, which means really, it's really basic, basic uh, stuff, you know, uh, more ventilation in the summertime, more shading in the summertime. And I, we think it's a big success if we can get our clients to want to uh, live without full blown air conditioning until late May, I mean, wouldn't that, you know, just shaving a month off of energy bills. So I just, I, I, I always feel like it's just a real endemic uh, or it, the conversation starts there. What is our expectation about how we're gonna be completely shielded from the world around us? And is that really good? That's, yeah. It's the same thing I said a little while ago. I don't know if I'm adding too much. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally all of us here in central Texas, we build hot boxes for our clients and then we throw cold air around inside the box. Right? Why aren't we building uh, thermally active surfaces into our buildings? It's doable. It actually will help with refrigerant use, right? So that, that's a big example, switching from um, doing things better to doing better things. I like that you took me there, David. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, 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 what happens is we keep adding new layers of technology. And I'm, I'm very pro-technology, but we keep having to, to come up with 
new layers of technology and systems to address the thing that we screwed up by creating the last technological. <laughs> and and it's system on system on system when really, if we could just say, wait a minute, what if we went back to the beginning and started over? What do we absolutely need? What can we live without? Um, I just think it makes us more connected to our environment. And, you know, not everybody is willing to go there, but a lot of people are willing to have that conversation. And I think that's the first step, frankly. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, what is, I've, ever since uh, you guys are positive energy mentioned thermal anesthesia a while back, I think in an email, I've been geeking out on it. And it, it's something that I thought, you know, I've been, I've been wanting, or I've been experiencing this my whole life. We all have, when you, you think about, uh, like when you go camping and you're sitting around or you come out of the woods and you're sitting around that campfire, and your back is freezing and the fire feels so good. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Asia and uh, they, when I was living there, they had heated floors and no AC. And in the middle of, of like a Korean winter, when you get up, and and like the room could actually be freezing it would be like 60 degrees but you get out and you stand on that floor it is so luxurious yeah it, i think that's a that's another uh, aspect of it that you know for for the the topic of this presentation that you're giving christoph you know we're talking about saving the planet um but but that thermal anesthesia stuff and we you know if you could integrate it in a way that did help with energy consumption um, that'd be good, but you also have the added benefit of that luxury aspect of it, which I think would help sell it. Yeah, the, it the has to be experience well. of comfort would be sumptuous. Yes, yeah, be great. Yeah, so yeah, if we if we stop like air conditioning, right? Why do we care what the air's condition is? Let's let's occupant condition. We should condition the occupants, not the air. Um, popped into my head when we were talking when when you were talking, Chris, because I know something we work with. Um, hey, architects. The lungs of the building, look, my lungs fit right here. They were, you know, if there was a grand design, it's here. Um, that's one reason radiant systems can be better is because maybe we don't, we're never gonna get enough space for mechanicals. But fundamentally, when you do massing, let us do massing. Let the mechanical systems massing occur with yours. The whole process, this is, this is where process as technology comes in. Architects design a home, it goes to a GC, it gets framed, and then the installing contractor walks in, right? whoa, it's ridiculous. And then we, we require, and, and we're going through that, we go through this over and over and over. We've got to melt the mechanical systems into the baked potato, you know, like butter. It's got these nooks and crannies and, you know, you're going to build a building for your client. You know, it's going to be having heated and cooled air in it. You know, it's going to need to be ventilated. <laughs> you know, the air should be filtered all the time. Simply include that in your architectural purview, right? Where do those systems go? They don't go in the magic nooks and crannies in the trusses all the time, right? Um, there's one quick comment I wanna make and Sergey, brace yourself, hey, Sergey. So when we talk about systems change, we talk about, you know, hearts and minds, right? Like you can, you can, I hope you can hear it. My whole soul, as Joe Biden said recently, is in what I'm saying to you. I feel very exposed, but I know there are people, many, many of you that are really committed to these transitions that are underway. And Sergey has a client that Sergey is, paying for the passive house rating, he's willing to do, uh, put a lot of skin in the game to a get a passive house. And he's trying to do it for an affordable fee, right? Like really low dollars per square foot. If that happens, oh my gosh, that is such a powerful lever. And it's one architect, one client helping to shift a paradigm in our industry, right? So sorry if I embarrassed you, Sergey, but yeah, you're awesome. And I hope it works out. And the jury's still out on whether it will. <laughs> oh, you're muted still somehow. Although it doesn't show muted. Okay. Anyway, Sergey Belov works at UT. He's also trying to get BS Passive House into UT building renovations. So you can see each one of you has agency, has role power, and some of you also have this added layer. Any of you that have an F in front of your AIA, that is status power, right? That is a responsibility you have to your industry. It is not about you like bow before me. It's like, what can I do? So there was another kind of, I know we're getting towards the end here, but the uh, Lauren um, had a really kind of interesting approach. We said curious about intersecting this com uh, conversation with the passive building approach, you know, a la Sergey, which is uh, more or less sealing off from the outdoors. So what is the balance between 
um, a, a more sensible way of design that's also you know not completely putting people in hermetic chambers <laughs> hermetically sealed chambers yeah it's a good question you know so we talked about this several times on the podcast right like so like David's talking about it, indoor outdoor space, a room in the house that can, it's your living room, it's your grand central hall. It can be completely opened up to the outside or it can be closed in, but the mechanical systems need to recognize that, right? They need to, to adjust for that. But um, we are really set up to find delight in nature. I mean, just, uh, you guys know about fractals, right? If you look at a bunch of square lines that has a very low fractal content. But if you look at the sky, the water, the trees, the grass, high fractal content, we actually get cheered up just by seeing high fractal content imagery. That's part of our central nervous system, part of our amazing body. So letting people see outside, designing to be outside is very important. It is true that we are in an area where, you know, on the, on the graph of the psychrometric chart of temperature and, and humidity, we are here and comfort is down here usually. So um, like for the most part in Austin, it's, it's rare that the outdoor conditions as they are, are gonna give comfort, but well-shaded buildings, um, air movement, let's do, let's do radiant and make the outdoor table or the wall you know, cold. And then, it, then all we need to do is cool the wall and that'll radiantly cool the people. We really, we're ready to evolve past just conditioning the air and giving people thermal blandness in their little box, longing to be outside. Um, yeah. Great, great one, Lauren. If you want to chime in and say more, I don't, I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, some really thoughtful questions. So I think my, uh, my plan worked. <laughs> Someone's talking. It's not. That's not coming from me here. I think that was just from Mari's shop, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would like to just stress that uh, it's been within the last six months for here at Positive Energy, at least, right? We're working nationally. Many, many architects. Like, let's talk about my design process. Let's talk about the culture at, at my uh, business. Let's talk about... Um, signing me up for the 2030 challenge. Let's talk about new enclosure standards. Let's talk about new, like all my projects are just gonna get this. You work with my firm, you get this, right? Like there's a firm in Austin that just committed to no more, you know, I'll give you the dirtiest, sootiest fireplace you want in your outdoor patio, right? So there are little things that every architect can do. And I, I think it's such an important realization that to remember that, oh, I, I can stop sharing this to remember that there is not some other group of architects coming to save us and we can just coast through our career, right? This is really something for us to do. This is our role. And I'm super grateful to be, um, you know, really like truly profoundly grateful to be able to be part of this conversation. Holy moly, the chat is going off, Miguel. I just turned it on. Thank you, David. So um, I guess we could wrap it. Yeah, I was going to say thank you so much. Um, I know I enjoyed that very much. I think it was an excellent overview of the many, 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 many ways we need to examine our practice daily. And I think it, it is a great start to the year. And hopefully we can all continue um, coming back to this and thinking about that big picture. Um, again, oh, sorry. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you. Um, and next month we have a Joe Crow project, so I hope you guys will all come back for that. Thank you again to Positive Energy and all of our sponsors. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Bye bye. Thanks, Chris. Doll. Good seeing everybody. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there totally was. <laughs> Travis just dropped a really great piece of feedback in the chat, um, said it would be awesome to see some case studies toward the ends of uh, this kind of, uh, kind of presentation. I miss yeah. that. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah, I, I uh, hey Travis, yeah, I agree. They're, they're, I'm just a little theoretical. We should get some of those projects. Somehow you're muted as well. Travis. Oh, you muted and unmuted, now you're muted again. <laughs> you guys are jumping on me. So yeah, 
Uh, obviously, you have a lot of experience with some real world examples where we're reframing this conversation and it's been successful. So I know you talked about, you know, maybe the passive house stuff that's happening now, but I mean, there's certain, you know, maybe it is a little bit of baby steps and it can also be some grand steps, but just it's always refreshing to hear that positive or see that positive example and how they accomplished it because it helps. Yeah, you know, so absolutely. There's, there's lessons learned that can be shared there um, as examples. And I know you got some. You're right. There's nothing that cuts through disbelief like that can't exist and saying, no, here it is. <laughs> and I guess my trepidation is sort of the the client asking the client, can I publicly talk about, you know, your process? But a lot of them would probably say yes if I did that. So point well taken, Travis. We have a client working on a radiant system in Austin right now. I, I can't wait to present. It's in, in design. Can't wait to present it. Yeah, that's a exa perfect example of something that I wanted to do, you know, a decade ago and was really, you know, just too much trepidation uh, with the hot human climate and having someone try it. And then, you know, this is where you learn the lesson yep. and um, take the risk um, and see if there's a way, especially with a really tight envelope you know, that you can pull that off. And it makes sense that you can. So, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's also like, are those parts distributed at the supply houses? Is there an installer that's going to know who's the guy, who's the pe who are the people that are putting it in and yeah so slowly over time like approaching the installer five years ago and he's like well maybe if you we fly someone in from colorado and then three years ago you know so gradually the installers like are learning that this Travis, is above my head right now that panel is isn't a, a cold active panel um and no, I, no. I my house is a 1919 bungalow with um it's like a it's a suggestion of an enclosure, as Christoph likes to say. It's like a glorified tent. Mm -hmm. But we were the contractor, he and I, and several other people. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do on a lot of these things, really. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to see. I'd like to see it. I'd like to feel it. The, get in there, maybe you see uh, what that space is like, you know, and and how it's how it's affecting, you know, just from my own personal experience. Obviously, it'd be good to see what your data is on it too. Is it, is it a, has it been a positive yeah. um, effect in your space? Yeah. yeah right also now that in this space, you know, because it's so old, it works pretty well whenever the temps are mild. But on like hot summer days, um, obviously, I don't have any insulation in the walls doing anything for me uh, with plenty of humidity getting in. But the, we have a dehumidifier manages it. Um, but in the afternoons, we have to kick on an auxiliary um, VRF unit just because we don't have an enclosure. Mm -hmm. If we and actually we, when we ran the loads for uh, the, the panel sizing to figure out how much we would need. I think we exceeded the total surface area of our ceilings in right. order to actually sufficiently do it. I so there's no way it'll ever keep up. <laughs> but what's the what's the source of the cold of the cold fluid? An air it's water a, heat pump. Yeah, okay. yeah, air to water heat pump. And CO2 I've got a mechanical like, room downstairs with a buffer tank and Yeah. Usually it's like 40% of a ceiling is needed to cool the whole space. And you still need air, right? You need to filter, ventilate and dry. Um, but thermally, yeah. That's one thing, one takeaway I wish I had said is like, as soon as someone's talking to you about heating and cooling, like, yeah, yeah, of course we're going to heat and cool. Talk to me about drying, ventilating, and filtering. That's what I want to talk about. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Stan, Mari. It's almost. Thank you. I was just going to add one little thing to Travis's. I think the client education is so important. And so once you have those case studies, it's like you said, it's that proof and being able to show it to the client and say, this is really it. This is really it, you know? The sky's yeah. not falling. <laughs> yeah. I would love, I know a lot of architects kind of remodel or build their own offices. Man, what an opportunity. Oh yeah, absolutely. This radiant, right? This is an ERV, you feel this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dylan Kyle down in Houston did a really good job with that. They, they own their own office um, building and uh, put in a lot of different form factors of VRF systems in there. And, and this was before VRF was really more popular or as popular as it is now in Houston. Uh, and it's it's made a lot of their, pushed a lot of their projects to go that way because people can see it, they can kick the tires. And we have it at our, you know, we have a bunch of stuff you can come kick the tires at uh, on at our office. If anybody's ever interested, just let us know. You have to wear a mask. But... Yeah, you have to wear a mask. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to bail out. Thank Wonderful. you guys so much. That was really great. I appreciate Everybody. your time. Thanks to those of you who stayed late. Have a good one.